Welcome back to New Rockstars. This is a big question. The show that gives you too much information about how the biggest crossover event of all time might have been a crossover of plot holes with over sentimental fan service bullshit. But hey, Avengers Endgame wasn't that bad, right? No, it was great. And Philip's gonna prove it. I'm Eric Voss here with Philip Molina. How you doing, man? Mm, uh, <laughs> mm. Things aren't great right now, yeah. but so maybe this actually is the, the right place for me to come at this question with, where it's like, why you gotta, gotta hate? Why you gotta hate the, the few things that we like? The few things that we should be able to agree on? Yes. No. I'm not allowing it. No! All right, not allowing it. Well, I will be the judge this week, Mr. Molina, because my question for you is, did Avengers Endgame actually suck? As much as I wanna flippantly just say, no, let's move on. I do think it's important that you guys know that we get accused all the time of being the fan service channel, the channel yes. that is a simp to the Mickey, uh, <laughs> a pair of nerds that are, you know, milking the teat of the Feige beast and loving it. Just like Luke Skywalker slurping up that Feige milk, wiping her mouth, enjoying every gulp. My point is that we get accused all the time of refusing to acknowledge when something uh, Disney made, or Marvel specifically, mm -hmm. is not any good. And so, I'm gonna f lean into it, mother f Surprise, mother Let's go item by item. We've re we're reaching the end here of our Infinity Saga rewatch. Uh, there's hate for this movie, and I, no, you know what? I'm going to full on fanboy out. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you'll allow me today, on behalf of my client, Mickey uh, and Feige, uh, <laughs> and what the hell, uh, let's throw in Okoye. Americans. I'm gonna address some charges that are being called plot holes, uh, character issues from all these amazing screenwriters, can't wait to read your scripts, uh, saying that the characters were flawed, and uh, people who said, you know what, as a kind of like cap to the 22 film saga, it was a little bit of a letdown. No. I will not allow that. Okay. Prosecution uh, is welcome to share any evidence they have. I know that a lot of it's coming from one so-called Cinema Sins. Oh yeah. Eric, I don't know how you feel about Cinema Sins. Very funny, uh, fun to watch, but I can't get through one of those videos with that at least a couple times saying like, oh, come on. Oh, really? Just a couple of times? At least. Uh, because. <laughs> uh, I assessed very heavily their everything wrong with Avengers Endgame. And of course there were some salient points like the logo showed too long or <laughs> the Avengers bathrooms are too fancy. You know, maybe my favorite, uh, you know, really, really uh, important point to make is that Pepper uses far too many lamps. Why the f does Pepper need five lamps and one lit candle to read a book about composting? Well, what's the criticism there? That it's uh, energy inefficient or <laughs> too big of a carbon footprint? It's all probably powered by an arc reactor, like it's sure, the yes. size of a Clean bumblebee. Clean burning injury. They live on a farm. You know, they're refertilizing yeah. everything and uh, growing all their own food. <laughs> So I will let uh, Cinema Sins and a few other sources serve as the prosecution. I'll only be addressing what I consider to even be close to legitimate problems, the okay. su substantial charges that they've made. I'm gonna only focus on things that happen on screen in the film during the movie because there's still other movies that are gonna be getting made. We don't know what happens off screen yet. So by the end of this video, or at least this segment, I expect uh, for you haters out there to either exonerate this film fully and accept that it is the greatest uh, superhero <laughs> film of all time. I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But I had one of the best videos of all time. Not counting Dark Knight. Ugh. And maybe even get a, give it some sort of medal of some kind, Ooh, or, or or a sparkle buck. Yeah, sparkle buck's got your name on it, buddy. Uh, or you can you're welcome to hit unsubscribe. <laughs> no, don't tell them that. Don't tell them that's an option. <laughs> oh God. Let's hear it, Eric. What is what is the case against my client? Okay, um, the first charge that I have for you. How did Captain Marvel not know about Thanos and his stolen mission earlier? Captain Marvel. Uh, a uh, policeman of the the universe mm -hmm. um, is theoretically gonna know about all uh, major threats. Here's the thing. Captain Marvel, as she made very clear, There are a lot of other planets in the universe, and unfortunately, they didn't have you guys. Is dealing with an insanely huge threat 
very far away. And Eric, do you know how big the universe is? Um, well, it could fit big. in that Men in Black marble. No, that's out, that's an internal galaxy. Oh. The universe is where those aliens live. How can they fit it all on that one disc that's spinning in space? That 2D hurricane that is the universe? What we want is to respect the facts. <laughs> it is insanely huge. And here's the two reasons why that's awesome. One, that means that she's gonna get a sequel film that is, where she's dealing with something so major mm. that she was distracted. And two, it shows us how the Marvel Cinematic Universe isn't anywhere close to being done yet, where Thanos isn't exactly registering on her radar because she's aware of how big the other uh, threats are in the entire universe. But let's keep it really narrow for a second. All we need to do is establish a little bit of doubt here of why she wouldn't care in a moment. He didn't have the stones yet. And okay. the, from the moment that he has all the stones, yes, he is now a universe level threat. And she comes running and smashing when she needs to at that point. Before then, he's kind of a local hometown thug, like you were. That's right. And, uh, you know, I'm still, I'm still Eric from the block. I'm still Eric from the block. And I, I got the ass that won't quit either. I can pole dance. I can pull that off. As soon as we get back in the studio, I'm forcing us to do a pole dancing episode. You don't gotta force it. <laughs> I, I think you make a very good point, Philip. And Captain Marvel, um, there's lots of warlords, and the Thanos' stone quest happened overnight. It's hard to keep up with that. I get it. Another charge, though. When Scott Lang was going through the streets of San Francisco after being awoken by a rat, why would trash still be piled on the streets five years later? Eric. <laughs> really? This is your charge. I said the streets of San Francisco, not the surfaces of my bedroom. Uh, oh, this wasn't a personal accusation, but I love when you out yourself. It's like that episode that we had to bleep your bathroom mishaps. Uh, that's right, buddy. You show that turd who's boss. Uh, <laughs> so um, here's the thing. It's five years later and certain streets in San Francisco are covered in trash. We did not see you know, a sweeping survey of all the streets of San Francisco. So people wondering why would there be so much trash five years later, you got to remember that we're kind of like what we're dealing with now, people pay different attentions honestly to the neighborhoods that yell the loudest. Uh, this, this is serious for a second here, but there's a reason why protests tend to be focused in the neighborhoods where the decision makers live right. uh, or where the news cameras want to show up because that's where you get uh, uh, the attention, but that's also the first place to institute new changes. So if something like the snap happened, there are gonna be all kinds of issues with foreclosures, unclear ownership of certain homes, and a decimated, well not decimated, half a mated uh, workforce of uh, sanitation workers. So all of those things combine so that absolutely there is going to be a trash issue citywide, countrywide, worldwide, but they're probably getting there and, and it's much better in certain places, but with that reduced workforce and then a bad census of who even lives on what streets, which streets are nearly empty now, what streets are maybe dangerous now to enter in, there probably is a much reduced schedule of picking up that trash, especially in certain neighborhoods where honestly they just don't care about those people that much. And that might be the kind of neighborhood that Scott Lang's family lives in. What the hell happened here? <laughs> Very good point. Anyone who lives in New York City, at least, knows that it, it doesn't take that long for the trash to build up, even when society is supposed to yeah. be functioning correctly. And let's talk about pin particles. So if, if you were watching last week's episode, you know the Quantum Realm has some explaining to do. First of all, why did the Avengers make their first trip just going to Hank Pym's 1970s lab and steal plenty of Pym particles to give them lots of room for error and then they wouldn't have such a limited supply? Why didn't they do that, Philip? Why didn't they do it? Well, one, screenwriting-wise, we want a limited resource to be part of this whole thing, right? How many okay. bullets you got left? It's like, how many Pym particles you got left? All right. And then, uh -huh. you know, if it was like, oh, good thing I own an ammo store, it's not as tense a film if they just have endless Pym particles. But you want an in-universe explanation, do you not? Yes, I always do, and there always must be one. A couple reasons. One, they are worried about making unnecessary trips in general anyway, so adding another trip that's just one to go get all, all the pin particles, not ideal. But more important, let's say they go back to Pim's lab early on in his research 
and wipe out his storage of pin particles. Or maybe even they just take half of what he's got of pin particles, but he's barely got a stable enough situation to maintain the ones he does have. What's gonna be a bigger issue to the eventual ramifications of their adjustments to the timeline? Them taking just enough, just as many as they need to accomplish their task, or let's take this thing that we're relying on to save the whole world and anything that Ant-Man in the future has done, anything that the previous Ant-Man had done in the past, let's wipe that out nearly. Let's make it much more likely that he's gonna have issues with the fact that he suddenly, his first major batch of pin particles is mostly gone. It is gonna be too destructive to the past. That's a major, that's like going back and taking the kite out of Einstein's hand when he invents <laughs> gravity that is not correct you know like it's it's too big a deal I, I can see that point i think the the writers and the directors of the movie aren't really clear on whether or not time travel works like they say it's not back to the future if you make a change in the past it doesn't like have a ripple effect to the present it creates a new timeline but the writers seem to like double back on that and all their interpretations since then yeah so there has been a lot of debate uh, about where they they settled on how time travel uh, affects things i will say that i'm going to address this exact issue uh, in in a future part of this case uh, so stay tuned but let's just say that it is very important that they don't ruin younger Hank Pym, Michael Douglas, pre cunnilingus cancer. Uh, <laughs> Not everyone knows that reference as quickly as we do. <laughs> you confused so many people just at this moment. <laughs> we made it in a previous episode a big question. <laughs> Michael Douglas cunnilingus cancer. <laughs> Uh, it's his nickname. It's on the back of his jersey. Folks, Philip and I have a bit of a shorthand that you'll you'll pick up on, and you'll just get up to speed. It's, it's <laughs> just, <my> just stay <laughs> with us. Um, uh, well, uh, sticking with pin particles here. To me, this is the biggest plot hole in the movie. Just my personal gripe. How did Thanos get more pin particles to like? We know he had one, but he brought up his whole fleet to the present. How did that happen? This. This is your your biggest plot hole? This is your biggest issue? It's like the most annoyingly unexplained one. There's there's other bigger consequences ones. This is just one where it's like, you didn't even bother to come up with an explanation for this. There is an explanation. All Eric. right, okay, all right. Yes, Nebula was able to bring her sweet, sweet purple daddy a Lil Pym particle. Right. But remember that with Thanos is Ebony Ma, who is a genius level scientist. This guy, with Thanos, these people have been traveling through space for who knows how long, for longer than, than anyone really, to compare our stupid little Michael Douglas pre Cunnilingus cancer uh, ability uh, of science to what they can do, especially once they have an item to reverse engineer. They were able to very quickly take this kind of impressive little particle and be like, oh yeah, I think I know how that works. And just make as many as they need. They're just way more advanced technologically than we are. Okay. That's, I mean, I get it. Reverse engineer. It's just too easy of an answer for something that happened off screen. But you know what? We didn't think about it in the moment. I'll say that when well, I watched the movie, I didn't really think about it. I'll say there was a TV show once that I really liked that I forget what it's called right now. But it like <laughs> got canceled really quick. He like kind of can, ex he explores two timelines at the same time. And one time he accidentally leaves his iPhone back in the 60s. And when he comes back to present day, everything's different. It's like a hundred <laughs> years in the future now. Uh, because like just these one little glimpse that thanks to reverse engineer, they can inspire a whole world of uh, eternal Steve Jobs equivalents, Ebony Ma. Let's move on. At the moment of the snap, how yes. was it light, daylight in Wakanda and New York with Maria Hill and Nick Fury, but also in San Francisco and the Hawkeye Farm in Iowa all at the same time? How is it all daylight? I bet you think you're so clever pointing this out, right? Oh, it's daylight in different places around the world. How is that possible at the exact same time? Unless the earth is flat. Is that what you're getting at? That's it. The sun was just shining on all of it. God aimed it <laughs> just in the right spot. Eric, it's easy. It's called 5 p.m. in East Africa. At 5 p.m. in East Africa, where Wakanda is, it would be light out, correct? Sure, all right. So, oh, no, just you. say yes. What, it's 5 p.m., just say yes. Just say yes. I'm going with yes. you on this. Okay, yes. In San Francisco, so all the way across the United States, it is 7 a.m. at that time. Light is out. And then in New York City, it would be 10 a.m. 
So all of the United States and a significant amount of, of Africa perfectly within daylight hours. Now, the only thing I will say is that you might think, hey, that means that Hawkeye and his family are having a hot dog brunch at 9 a.m. in Iowa. Yeah, who eats hot dogs with no mustard that early in that day? Oh boy, 3 a.m. <laughs> That's the issue, that, that early. Well, you know what? You know what? you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what farmers do? Farmers wake up at 5 a.m. to go yell at a horse. So <laughs> four hours later, that is lunchtime for them. They're just, they're just getting started. They, they're going to get ready for bed soon. 2 p.m. I Out. don't know, Philip. I think uh, 7 a.m. in San Francisco would not be that bright out. They have this big fog layer called Carl. It dampens the light, so it's it's pretty dark that early in the day. It just it looked like more of an 11 a.m. shoot time than a 7 a.m. shoot time. Just say. <laughs> All right, I want to move on to some uh, issues that we may call subjective uh, issues that deal with characters and plot, but are worth discussing. So they are disgusting. You're correct. <laughs> Those penguins are disgusting. Okay, let's discuss the combination Bruce Banner and Hulk. It left us with a character who is neither Bruce nor the Hulk, but it was kind of a fusion of the of the two, but like it was still basically Banner's mind. What happened to the Hulk identity we got to know in Thor Ragnarok? Yeah, none of their identity fully exists anymore, and that's why they've had to do, they've been, uh, from the beginning, here's, here's the thing that's un unfair to really put too much on the Hulk. From the beginning of this new version of the MCU, they haven't been able to give Hulk his due. They have to tell his story tangentially inside of the story of the other characters and in Avengers stories and in Thor stories. It's unfair because of the stupid universal rules and, right, and whatnot, yeah. but that means they kind of had to stick with it. So unfortunately, the culmination of this character's arc, where it's essentially the Jekyll and Hyde story, right? These, these two completely disparate beings, the idea that at some point they can exist harmoniously in the what is it the, the bicameras mind or something that it, that exists in two completely different states at the same time uh -huh. that is kind of a beautiful resolution for a character that we saw as either brilliant or a, a behemoth or a beast or something to be able to put them in this central place is a very interesting place to take it to and also it would make sense that that character is not quite all of either if those are his two extremes then he kind of can't be fully so maybe he is actually a little weaker than if he was pure hulk and went fully that way right so you know the fact that he ends up with his arm in a sling uh might might make make sense uh but also like i said uh, a few weeks back he probably not as smart either as happy were just pure Bruce Banner, but it's okay because at least he's living in harmony and this poor guy has been tortured with his broken mind uh, uh -huh. otherwise. So it's a nice evolution of the character and a nice completion of the first part, at least, of the Hulk arc. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we actually get to explore that character in yeah. a real way with maybe his own films or something uh, moving yes. forward. But it's the best they could do. Also, they had to cut a story for time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. And you know what? Like all the things we're talking about, if it doesn't bother you while you're watching the movie, I don't know if it really counts as a plot hole. And I would, I would agree with you on this, that seeing Hulk in this new form is far more satisfying than like the complications that may arise later on when you're thinking about it. But let's talk about another example of this. And I, I don't necessarily agree with this argument, but I am bringing it up because other people have brought it to our Every attention. Every other argument. <laughs> the character of Fat Thor, this, this new version of him. <laughs> you can just call him Thor, Eric. But then people might get confused what movie we're talking about. Like they forgot what the title of the video is. It's like back when sitcom titles used to be insensitive. It's simple, it's Fat Thor, what do you care? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Some people will say it's it's not so much his weight, but it's his whole emotional state. So some people might say that he makes light of mental health issues by bringing up this, this new stage of depression he's in. Some people think uh, depression is, is a joke that you can just quickly move on from by losing weight. He, and he doesn't lose weight, which I think is actually a powerful choice That's that they, they made, that he doesn't just cure himself. It's it, You know what, honestly? I know that their plan initially was that he'd be skinny again at the end, or jacked at the end, uh, and I think that that would have made this argument a lot more valid yeah. if it was to say sad people are fat and healthy, you know, jacked people are, are happy and, and you know, actual heroes. Neither of those things is true. It's, right. it's too extreme. This is actually a much more authentic depiction of what it's like to go through depression. First of all, kudos to them for 
putting the mental health of one of the most powerful beings in the yeah. universe in a fragile state to show like, yeah, even this freaking guy goes through it. So it's okay that we go through it, especially during these times of epic level of, of disorder and change and feeling like, you know, you aren't worthy is something that they always put in the comics as kind of a thing that a king wonders about. But honestly, day to day, the average person, they kind of wonder sometimes like, man, I, I don't feel worthy of my own life. And what is that? What is that version of depression look like? like it does look a lot more like what we see there where you don't really want to go outside you just want to hang out with a couple of friends that you're comfortable with you kind of become more of an introvert what does tend to happen when you stay inside and you're not active and you don't really honestly care about your appearance your hair grows out gain weight you maybe all you do is, is play video games or something it's not an inauthentic representation the fact that they brought it in at all is to be applauded uh, and then honestly had they done it in a really dark intense way People would have seen that as as either pandering or that is making a mockery of what people's mental health state is like where you know it only exists in that way some of the saddest moments in my life are probably when i've been some of the funniest uh, performances that i've that i've had at that time too i know you've had that too yeah i definitely felt that way i i this is the one argument that i will bring up that i don't necessarily agree with i i, I think uh it was a great character arc i completely connected with him and i don't think it was laughing away too i thought it was very appropriate dealt with uh so you've won me over could you imagine if it also wasn't like funny at all to uh see have thor scenes after thor ragnarok yeah if, like he suddenly was was super dry and serious again oh uh, what would be weird it'd be insane but this is one thing that i think is a bit inexcusable natasha's death it was glossed over she did not get a funeral which tony stark did get a big funeral what's the deal first off just that last point tony stark getting a funeral is because Tony Stark is not just the lead of Avengers Endgame. Yeah. Tony Stark is the lead character of the Marvel Cinematic Universe up yes. to this point. Completely this fair is on Tony, yes. entirely his arc, his thing. I mean, they the fact that they flew in that kid, Harley, or whatever, just because like, he was... Yeah. The fact that they, they kept that child actor alive just to play this role, you know? Like, that's how much they wanted to show that it was a, a big deal, that this is Tony's end. Mm -hmm. But also keep in mind, they know that they're, they've got a Black Widow movie on the slate. They can, we have no idea what's going to happen in that. Hopefully they release it at some point soon. But not only is, is she going to have more story to be told, but ooh, it might not even be the end of her story yet. I think it's important to, this is one where it's like, you know what? They know that this character is worth more. That's why they're giving her a whole film. We got to hold off on, you know, if that's the only film she ever gets and it has an unsatisfying ending there and she just died sadly in Endgame, yeah, maybe it becomes a legitimate complaint, but right now it's too early to tell. Good point. We'll suspend our judgment until Black Widow comes out in 2024. Thank you. Strike that one from the charges then, yes. please. Stricken. Now, this is a point that uh, could mean a lot of different things, but some people have argued that the movie has too much mixing of tones. They weren't really clear how to emotionally react to any given moment. If it was meant to be too dramatic in some moment, too comedic, there's just too much emotion, I guess, is that? Is that what we're complaining about? My emotions! My emotions! All right, yes, well that's a complaint <laughs> and you have to address it. That's bullshit. I think that there's a reason why the, the rise of dramedy has been so strong. People want complex storytelling. The age of, of just a CBS sitcom and the you know dark uh, special victims unit kind of procedural or something, and those two worlds being so disparate, is not interesting to us anymore. It's kind of the same thing we were saying about the Hulk earlier, right? It's actually how the way that these things can coexist that is mm. more interesting, but also more authentic and true to life. But I'll also remind you, we've had both of those things and people don't love those either. One of the biggest issues that people don't like about Avengers, the Joss Whedon first Avengers film, is they're like, oh, it has almost too light of an energy for how mm. epic it should be. It's supposed to be this, this amazingly epic film, but it's very colorful, it's light. It comes from a guy who's mostly known for TV. So a lot of people are like, that, that movie just like doesn't, like hit with a wall up that you that you want it to and i'd say infinity war and endgame both did hit with that and then you know what happens when you get too dark martha why did you say that Dad? when we had batman yeah. versus superman and yeah. everybody was like like holy crap i mean batman is, is a dark character 
but Superman also is like super dark. And like that whole world, that talk about a place that uh, seems like San Francisco with no sunlight or something. That world is drained of anything that resembles our, our lives either. So you can't have it both ways. You can't be mad at that and can't be mad at that. This was a more authentic representation of the world as it is. And then also, you know, when you're dealing with like super crazy, dark, sad stuff, like a lot of us kind of can relate to right now. It's also weirdly can still be a funny, fun, interesting time. We've had a lot of fun doing these episodes. A big question right smack in the middle of all this miserable dog shit. That's right. Okay, I want to move on to some of the issues with Endgame as a culmination to the whole Infinity Saga series, okay? The big one being the introduction of time travel. A lot of people will argue it removes the stakes for all future MCU movies because anytime something goes wrong, they now have a way they can just fix it with time travel. So this is what I was alluding to earlier that you could think that maybe the Avengers could have solved things differently with time travel before. So I would say that Part of the blame here comes with the fact that the Russo brothers and also the writers and also Feige, they've all depicted time travel a little bit differently whenever they make statements about it. But where it seems like we might be landing right now at the most recent statements I've read is actually a lot uh, more in line with what Reed Richards defines time travel to be like in Marvel Comics. Mm. And that's the concept that when you go back in time and you do anything at all, even really the act of going back in time, there's not a closed loop, right? You can't affect that time that you just came from, but you are actually visiting another dimension where these different events happen. <gasps> there's two important uh, takeaways from that. One, that means that no, they did not erase anything that's ever happened in a Marvel movie before. It is not different. That all really did happen and it all is canon still. So even all the way through Loki's death, right? Loki did die. That is canon. That character has had his neck snapped. The fact that we're seeing new adventures now is more akin to something like the ultimate storyline branching off from the main Marvel comics where now we see characters we've seen before. They even live some stories that maybe we've seen before, but it is not replacing what came before. So you can't say it removes the stakes of things that came before when technically the fact that we previously had other Spider-Man movies. Go web, go! Hey, wait, you can recast him as Tom Holland? But well, now I'm not worried about Tobey Maguire. <laughs> Technically, they're starting a whole new thing by doing time travel at all. Yeah, you can't judge a, an earlier movie based off of things that happen later in a series. But even, even then, the way that they're designing it is that they're saying we cannot change the things that have already happened in this series. We can only make new things. So all your old stuff is still precious and perfect. second thing that I disagree with about this idea that time travel removes stakes is that they are playing this idea of trope deconstruction that we've talked about before where Lord and Miller are really good at this where they take ideas that we've seen before and they really get into them of what the ramifications are. So something like the blip and Mr. Harrington's mm. wife uh, pretending to have disappeared. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of ingenuity that they're applying to these storylines of things we've maybe seen this idea of people going missing. We've seen a couple shows like that but people pretending to have done it now apply those brain towards something like time travel, this is my hypothesis, but I 100% think this is gonna happen. We're gonna see ramifications of time travel that are much bigger than we've ever seen in anything else. We're gonna see new dramas, new stakes that are because of messing with time. We've talked about the Time Variance Authority potentially right. uh, getting getting involved here. There, If you know Marvel Comics, you know that time travel is not something that is dealt with lightly. So actually they might've just made things a lot worse for themselves. So it's actually very exciting to see not only how they're gonna reinvent time travel style stories, but also how they're going to take existing time travel related stories that really mess things up and bring them into the movies. Fair enough, fair enough. And another a criticism some people feel about it, that it didn't correctly end the character arc of Black Widow, Tony Stark, and Steve Rogers. Having to end the character arc of three different characters in one two and a half hour movie, already very difficult to do, especially for characters that we care a lot about. But we can acknowledge what is important for these arcs and ask, did Endgame do that? So Iron Man's kind of the, the obvious one, right? Tony was very selfish, that's how we met him. He grew as a person, he found eventually that, you know, it's not just about him and he found a family in the Avengers, but also a little family with Pepper and his daughter. And he was at a point where he wanted that more than he wanted to be Iron Man, more than he wanted to be a hero. So he had all that growth that we realize in Endgame and then is finally tested in the in the most uh, difficult way 
of finally becoming the man that is not wanting to be alone and wanting to be a unit here with the family and then identifying the last strip of selfishness of him wanting to have that for himself is technically still him being selfish and so he pulls that away and lets himself die in order to save everyone else that character definitely completes his arc in in and then some then moving on I'll say Captain America is probably the next obvious one since we you know, really saw that he, he, he becomes an old man at the end. So it really feels like they've ended it. But Steve almost started as the opposite of Tony. Uh, and he's all about service and self-sacrifice. And he hates the fact that Tony is the other way. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the fact that we end him in a moment where he doesn't want to talk about the life he's lived uh, with Peggy in, in that moment where he asked some details about it. And that he decides, you know what, it's more important for me to allow myself happiness than to go back and continue whatever other Captain America movies I have to make. Instead, Chris Evans is like, I just want to get with her. Yeah. Uh, the actor said that. But that's a choice, a personal choice. And so realizing that his own life is valid and worthy mm -hmm. to just be happy in too is a nice completion of that character. And then finally, Black Widow. I mean, it's, it's again, I think there's a Black Widow movie coming. We might see a, a lot more meat put on that story's bones, but I think in just capping off with her sacrificial act, it does address the one thing that we knew was the gaping hole in Black Widow's life, and that's the fact that she's done so much bad, she has a lot of red on her ledger. Is there any way to make up for that? And it is to give her life, to bring back as much life as she can. Of course she can't undo the past, but it's the only way to add kind of black to her ledger and try to balance her books. It seems decent, at least, you know? Okay, and uh, one final criticism some people feel the movie was too fan servicey. Doesn't that mean like you get somebody off? What kind of fan doesn't want to be serviced? I rest my case. All right, no more needs to be said. Well, Philip, you want to wrap this up in a closing statement? Oh shit. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, I'll say. I love how many people uh, were listening to this whole thing to this point and they're like, you know, I kind of hated Endgame, but now, <laughs> why, why, why were you subscribed for so long? Reasons for doing something like that would be, uh, could be many. <laughs> I'll say, I think I've addressed a lot of alleged problems with the movie, but I want to also remind you the scrutiny that this movie is even trying to live up to. Citizen Kane, considered the best film of all time, was not dealing with even a couple decades worth of film to come before it. This movie has 80 years of movies before it <laughs> and comics that have explored every way that something can be done. And yet, we can all even agree that there's things that are just done for the first time at this level on this movie that it should not have even been breaking new ground but it is the most ambitious engaging team battle we've ever seen in in a movie of course you know are there more tense team battles that have existed sure but the scale and epicness of this that you also witness that scale and care so much about the number of characters it's kind of like uh, the opening scene to saving private ryan is epic in level and length and i would say they're comparable now imagine if 20 or 30 of the characters that are out there storming the beaches of normandy you're like no don't get hurt i'm worried about each right. and every one of you and i know your name and i know your backstory and i care about each of you and i hope your arcs are being paid off so even with half of the key characters snapped away the ones that are there we still care that much about and they still have these satisfying emotional arcs and their motivations the fact that this movie is even coherent and understandable for everything you need to have in it, that's remarkable, much less the fact that it's good enough that people cheer out loud at moments and are crying at the end credits. In two and a half hours, they wrapped up, what, 22, 23 movies, culminating in the most impressive, ambitious, and lucrative <laughs> movie in the history of film. Basically, they stuck the landing. So is it perfect? No especially some of the science. But if we wanted perfect science, then we would watch Bill Nye and his perfect body. We wanted a moving cinematic experience on an epic scale and it f***ing delivered. All right, was well, it my turn now to weigh in as a judge? Are you the judge I the think whole time? this whole time I have been the same person. I'm just the judge. I think it's my, I have to give you a verdict. You put up such a well-researched and argued argument. I thought we were going to get the, that, uh, the goat guy from Mr. Sunday Movies. Not the acronym goat. I think he's just a goat, right? Yeah, he's the goat of what he does. 
It's great. Uh, yeah. No, that's fine. If you're the judge, uh, uh, I would have been a lot nicer to you this whole time. Yeah, I know. Maybe you should consider that for the future. Uh, uh, this will work. Uh, hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> the judges don't do that. What am well, I doing? Hey, this is stupid. Why, why did no you no you commit to your bit you no. you went and got a suit jacket from the big and tall store <laughs> for this bit during quarantine. Common law traditions are stupid. We stopped wearing powdered wigs in America. We should stop putting them in these fancy bathrobes too. I like how many people in the in the viewing audience, well the listeners, have no idea what just happened. Even the viewers are like, I think Eric tried to make two puppets be, be a two-headed judge. It was a robe. All right, Philip. I was going to weigh a different direction, but now, uh, no, I think um, <laughs> if, if the question on the table is, did Endgame suck? Of course not. Of course you made a very good argument for why this movie deserves to be considered cinema and deserves to rank among some of the best film experiences of all time and definitely deserves right. to be the most profitable film of all time. It, it definitely earned all of that. I do think it is a very good movie and uh, an experience I'll never forget. I uh, do think the fact that it has made so much money allows it a bit more of a target on its back for people sure. to criticize in the same way that people criticize Avatar. It's already made all of its money. It's already paid for so many grandkids okay. colleges at this point. <laughs> so do we need uh, do we not need to sure. say it's also artistically perfect? No, it's not. Uh, and I do think there are more questions than answers when it comes to not just the science, but just the movie's own internal logic. It's not things that we could just forgive to the screenwriters for saying like, whoa, you did everything else right. It, it robbed the movie of some very interesting payoff with Steve Rogers' return journey. There's some really interesting storytelling that they just sidestepped because they just wanted this sight reveal of old Steve Rogers, which I agree when I watched it, I thought was very uh, moving. But I will say that refrigerator logic kicked in about halfway to the walk to the refrigerator of like, what the hell did we just see? Like, why is he old now? Like, it, it confused me too quick after the awe moment. Had they just ended with like him being back in the 40s dance with Peggy Carter, would have been perfect. They didn't need to have old man Steve. They could have just showed him in the past. And you wouldn't have all these haters, I think. You would have fewer haters. But at the end of the day, Philip, I think your argument is valid. Is that what? You want that? Uh, uh, the case was a, a murder trial. Oh! Uh, yeah, did they kill cinema by making this movie? Uh, I will do what the Supreme <laughs> Court does all the time to say, stare decisis. We're going to let a lower court ruling stand. Boo! Boo! <laughs> because we're all political hacks now that were chosen for political reasons instead of applying real judicial principles. Are these the two puppets? <laughs> the puppets ran away and now they're puppeting me. <laughs> the puppets was our political system the entire time. <laughs> Isn't that the bit? The entire time? The entire time. <laughs> the entire time. The entire time. Does everybody know what time it is? Show time! Well, we're getting in a tired time now. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the um, biggest grievances fans have with their lives is the fact that many of them are losing their hair and they find that a bummer. You like that segue? <laughs> yes. Seamless. It, they say that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35, if you can believe it. Yeah. Professor X probably still wishes he looked like McAvoy. If he had a say in it, he would probably want to use Keeps. Thank you to Keeps for sponsoring this episode. <laughs> With Keeps, it's easier and more affordable to get treatment for your hair loss and help you keep the hair that you already have. Yeah, they offer the generic versions of the two FDA-approved hair loss uh, products. Those are the same ones I've used. Uh, which are the only things that really work. Uh, they're half the cost of the, what they cost at the pharmacy. Yeah, and you know what? You don't even have to go to your doctor's office if you use it. You can just do it all from home, where you're probably you know stuck right now anyway. You just meet with a doctor online, and they ship that treatment right to your home. They also have more five-star reviews than any of their competitors. I think it's like 100,000 men use them for their yeah. hair loss prevention medication. Yeah, so if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, just go to keeps.com slash big question to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E. PS.com slash big question. Bite size <laughs> questions. <laughs> choo choo. It's the bite size train. <laughs> Come on, ride the train. And you think you can pull dance. <laughs> uh, do you remember that from 10 hours ago when we started this episode? I think I can. I think I can.
I, I hope that's what you're doing on the pole. <laughs> just like, stop shouting uh, your mantra uh, or say it's sexier. I think I can. You know what I think I can do? I think I can tell you that we've got some bite-sized questions for you. Great. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right, number one, Jackals18. This one's from Discord. Uh, if Asgardians live for 5,000 years, how much time has passed for Thor during his time in the MCU? Oh, because we have flashes of him in other times too, right? That's right, yeah. And they just we just know Asgardians have this longer lifespan. Well, okay, so in Avengers Infinity War, which, you know, we just rewatched, Thor told Rocket... You know, I'm 1,500 years old. Which, you know, if you think about it, he was probably rounding up because according to most sources, I'm pretty sure Thor was like born sometime in the 900s. That was before 965, but sometime in that century. But that would mean he was closer to 1100, but let's take him at his word, 1500 years old. So assuming an Asgardian lifespan of 5,000 years, that would mean he is 30% of the way through his life. So if we map that over a human lifespan, which you know, place it around 80 years or so, he would be the equivalent, 30% into that, of 24 years old. So the Thor we're looking at is like a 24 year old Asgardian. So the- Acts like it. <laughs> yeah, he's got that kind of sensibility, right? In the years that we've seen in the MCU, Thor's first movie was in 2011, Endgame was 2023, that's 12 years, so in an Asgardian numbers, that would equate to about 70 days of his life, right? If he was going through normal. So it's like, imagine the whole MCU has passed by for Thor for what would be about two months from our perspective. But the reason I say from our perspective is time is relative. It's an abstract invention that humans use to keep track of everything. When we're younger, two months feels like a really long time. When we're older, time seems to be moving faster. Two months is like, yeah, I can do two months. But to a guy in his early 20s, like 70 days can be a very influential period in one's life. Like that's, that's an unforgettable summer. That's one crazy semester in college. That's a real turbulent relationship. You know? So to Thor, he's like, you know, he's a college age bro who for the past two months has experienced more ups and downs than at any point earlier in his life. And that's a completely reasonable thing. Eric, that is a very well thought out, interesting answer. I'm sorry, I think I misread the question though. It's how much screen time has passed for Thor in minutes in the in Marvel movies. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be right back. I can say that he had 14 and a half minutes in Infinity War, and I don't know anything other than that. <laughs> That's the only fact you know about anything now. <laughs> yeah. I forgot your mother's name. Who? Martha! Number two, <laughs> Colonel Hogan uh, wants to know, this is also from Discord, uh, thank you for your service. How do parents and genetics work in the Matrix? Mm. Okay, so, oh, this is really interesting, actually. So if, you, if two people are your parents in the Matrix, do you actually have the DNA of those two people in your real body? That is a very good question. Are the machines playing, like, matchmaker between, like, yeah, sperm they, and they ova? Yeah, they must, because our, our bodies in the Matrix look like our bodies in the real world. Keanu Reeves has the yeah. same appearance, you know. Different he's bald, haircut. But then he grows back. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Let's think back, Morpheus did say humans are no longer born. Where human beings are no longer born, we are grown. So that would imply that in the farms of the real world, where all the, the pods are, sex cells are being harvested, the sperm, egg, from human pods, and then they're taken, they're mixed, and they're gestated in artificial wombs where the baby's incubated, and then they spend their whole life in that in that pod. But yeah, our, our projections in the Matrix do look like our real selves, so presumably the Matrix must be monitoring hmm, which projections in the simulation are hooking up. And they're like, okay, these two? Okay, let's go back and look at the archives, and they go find those pods in the real world, and then like, all right, and then. Like Doc Brown, like with the, the two uh, cables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, and, it, and, it, and it takes them so that, you know, it all corresponds real world versus Matrix. And then like when the two computerized simulation, or not simulations, but just like they, they have sex, they'll make it happen in the real world as well. So that their offspring will inherit their traits and then they create a version of that for their Matrix. But... I think something that we have to acknowledge is that originally the Wachowskis did intend on another element to their world building that there would be identity switching with some people between the simulation and the real world, at least in their original concept. So the character Switch, that character was named Switch because originally they were going to be trans. There was going to be one gender in the real world, another gender in the Matrix. And that would suggest that our projections in the Matrix don't have to match our real appearances and that the machines 
Like, if you would think about it, the machines, what would be most efficient for them is to just, like, randomize who would mate with whom and just try to biologically make the most efficient battery. They wouldn't, they wouldn't try to play matchmaker, you know? Like, they would, they would just be like, this with this. Right. Maybe they do that and then they rewrite the story. And that's, like, why it's like, I'm suddenly drawn to you, Eric. Right, right. But that would just imply that, like, uh, we have less free will in the Matrix, which I know we don't have really any free will, but, like, it seems like there are life decisions we can make that have consequences within our algorithm. So it just depends on where on the spectrum of free will you think things are falling. There is some free will in the Matrix. But I think what we'll see, Matrix 4 is coming out. My prediction for that movie is I think they're going to give us some clearer answers on how reproduction works. Just because that question of identity is so crucial to the Wachowski story, right? Like, and I think they're gonna want to be able to tell that because they they were forced to remove that backstory from Switch in the original Matrix. And I, I would not be surprised if that is addressed in the new Matrix movie considering like how big that story is now in, in our society, in our culture. So I think that will be part of it. And I think we're gonna learn that some people, the reason why they look like their parents in and out of the Matrix is because they're just made this old fashioned way of the Matrix playing matchmaker. Turkey basters. Yeah, there will be some that are the result of anomalies of just these randomized mix scenes that have different appearances in both their, their gender identity, maybe even their race in and out of the Matrix, which will be a very interesting topic to address. Eric, we gotta move on, because you are getting yeah. me hot. <laughs> oh, I do declare. When you talk about fertilization oh. strategies, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, it's your kids, Marty! We gotta make them! Right, Scott! <laughs> <laughs> this just became Rick and Morty. <laughs> yeah, all right, uh, number three. Uh, this is from two people on the Discord. Aw, speaking of uh, love match, Raven and Every Rose uh, wanna know, in Infinity War, how did, did they both ask these questions? Like alternate They both words? asked it, they both asked it. In Infinity War, how did Heimdall know exactly where on Earth to send Hulk, exactly where Doctor Strange was, basically? Oh. Like through the window. Yeah, how do you have the <laughs> coordinates, the right? Well, uh, there was that scene in Thor Ragnarok that established that Thor and Heimdall can like weirdly link telepathically. Like there's a moment where mm -hmm. Thor was on Sakaar, Heimdall was holding things down on Asgard and through like his orange eyes because he can peer into the soul of everyone. The eyes glowed, Thor's eyes glowed the same color and they were just like linked. Like Thor's um, consciousness teleported over to Asgard and they can just like live in a in a FaceTime chat. Like that's just a rule of the world that, that was introduced in that movie. Of course time. Yes. So there was that moment in Infinity War, Thanos defeats Hulk, and there's a brief look between Thor and Heimdall where they make eye contact and the light really reflects off of Idris Elba's eyes to make them look super orange. And I think that was the moment where Thor telepathically gave Heimdall direction saying, look, it's too late for me, but let's send Banner to Earth to the Sanctum Sanctorum, which I just met this guy, Dr. Stephen Strange. He can teleport people around places instantly so he can link. It's probably the safest place to send him right now to send this message of warning. I think it happened in that moment telepathically off screen. So like, show me the place in your mind where you want him to go. Yes, yes, yes. Very cool. Eric, there's time for one qu ooh, 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 quick mailbox question. Is it a box? Is it a bag? No one knows, you old hag. It's a box. Don't call me a hag. <laughs> ooh, it's on a little strip this time. Speaking of a little strip, Eric's pole dance episode uh, coming soon. <laughs> I can't take this off. It's, it's just, just like a chest dicky. <laughs> Eric, have you ever bullied anyone intentionally or by accident? Oh, I've done both. Hmm. I've R raise your hand if you feel like you've been victimized by Eric. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, hey, I was a little stinker all through grade school and high school, and everyone who feels like they've been a victim of bullying has probably also dished it back out. We're all victimizing each other, all right? I definitely bullied someone. I uh, didn't realize I did it at the time. It was called out later. So in college, Philip and I, we mentioned that we were part of this big improv cult. It was a cult. It was a big improv group. And I think what people don't understand is this is not like your college improv group where there's like 10 or 12 kids, like their acapella group, and they just do their random shows and no one laughs and it's weird. This was a hundred people. And we had this weird um, deal with the theater college where they let us come in and teach their um, improv classes each of which had 40 kids in it, and all of those students, according to our club's constitution, were members of our club. They were required to go see our shows. <laughs> yeah, so they had to buy a shirt from us and perform on our shows for their class credit. So at any given time, we had like 100 people 
who were part of this club. But it was such a weird group of people. It was wonderful in that like we would just have these events, like we would get booked to do a show and then we'd all meet in the student union and just kind of take over a corner of it. And you'd see like 20 or 30 of us all just show up and just like do bits. It was so goofy. You would go into a classroom somewhere and you just find people just doing a bit and like, is a show going on? We don't really know. Because everyone's constantly on trying to make each other laugh. And there was a show that we were booked for one time and our meeting place is going to be in our, our student union cinema, which has like, it has a little stage there. And I go up and I have like my newspaper, our student newspaper, and I'm just like sitting there looking around and I see like our, our buddy Rudy waiting for the show to start. And some of them, I think they're warming up. They're like down on the stage area. I'm sitting in the back of uh, the cinema and like they're all goofing around. So I think they're just doing warm ups. And then so I'm reading the newspaper, I'm chatting with other people as they're arriving. And then someone else comes in and they're like, what is Rudy doing? Uh, and when I saw them before, they were just like dancing around, like doing stupid voices up on the stage and they were taking tur turns getting up on the stage. And I barely look up for my newspaper. And I'm like, what's going on? And someone in, in that group look over and they go, um, he's uh, doing a comedy. And then I just like kind of laugh and I go like, yeah, he's trying to. But like, I thought they were all just doing bits. Later, everyone was really weird around me. And I was like, what is going on? And, and Rudy was really weird around me. I went home and my friend and roommate Max, he was, we were living together at the time. He's like, yo, boss, what? Why did you say that to Rudy? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you heckled him. I'm like, no, I did it. And he's like, boss, you totally heckled him when he was trying to do stand up. And then I, like, in Bruce Willis and the Sixth Sense replayed the night and, like, everything reassembled. And I was able to see myself from a third person perspective. And what had actually happened was Rudy had sent all of us a message and during announcements had said, hey, I'm going to get to this venue half hour earlier to test out some stand-up that I am working on. And everyone had gathered at the front of the cinema to watch him test out his stand-up for a show he was gonna be doing, like it was like a comp competition show. I stroll in there with my <laughs> student newspaper, don't understand what's going on because I probably wasn't paying attention to when Rudy asked for people to come support him and give him feedback. And I sit down there and I <laughs> read my newspaper, talking during his show to other people, and then when someone asks, what's Rudy doing? They turn around and we're probably like, he's trying to do comedy or like he's doing a show right now. And I go, ha, he's trying. And then I realized that I had heckled him and I looked like a huge fucking asshole. And then I messaged him later. I'm like, you're not gonna believe me. I, it wasn't what it seems. I didn't realize what you were doing. But in order to explain to him that I wasn't heckling him, I had to reveal that I just completely ignored earlier when he was talking to the whole group. So either way, I was just a huge douchebag. And this was a nice, there were other times where I like accidentally said things to Rudy that I, I did not <laughs> mean. And uh, so in his head, he's like, this guy just has it out for me. This, I don't know why this guy's being such a douchebag. Uh, but I was an asshole and I bullied him. Eric. Here's the saddest part about it. The fact that you were in charge of the team that he was on, because I, re I remember that you were the director of his team. That's right, uh, I was his coach. Oh. Yeah, means he thought you were there specifically to support him. He thought it was the moment where his teacher came to the back of the room, didn't want to make a scene and just wanted to watch his student be, you know, all that he believes he can be. And instead, that's the person that turned on him. Yeah, and you know what? <laughs> the heck all Not only that, I replayed the night and I remembered briefly as my eyes moved back to the newspaper, seeing him on the stage and just a still frame of him frozen, his like whole demeanor just sunken. <laughs> like imagine, imagine if you're doing a show for your friends and you invited one of your friends and he heckled you with the meanest <laughs> way. You're a director, somebody you respect. It, it, the equivalent of imagine your your dad finally came to your baseball game. <laughs> <laughs> you're a loser. <laughs> And your dad's the coach of the team. <laughs> Take him out of the game. <laughs> it sucks. Robbie, you're my son now. <laughs> you're getting ice cream. I, How about I, you? Bullying. Um, I was I was trying. To, what's funny is that I I mean I got like mildly bullied at times, and then I I think I got uh, snarky back, so then I ended up bullying my bullies that way. Mm -hmm. But I I never felt like I was really a bully. Bully. I've always been like too into having friends <laughs> as much as I could. And but then I I as you were talking and I zoned out. I remember <laughs> no I'm kidding. But I I did remember from the same group of cult uh, brides. 
Um, there was a person there that is the only person that is ever on my enemy list. I know you okay. keep a very long enemy list. I'm oh, yes. trying to work my way down out of it if I can. Uh, but I, a lot of people do. Kind of normal, honestly. You hold a grudge, that's, that's your right to do. I try to never have that. Uh-huh. Except one page full of just one person's name. I know who this and is. You, of course you do. Mm-hmm. And the the only reason I can't even say his name is because I believe this person has committed crimes against humanity. <laughs> like, uh, seriously. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you know what? Yes. Right. For sure. Currently, yeah. Uh, okay, so this person was so awful to me and to Eric at times, but way worse to me in college. Uh, awful to a girl that I dated that Eric later dated for a reason he will never tell me. Well, uh, there's a reason why we can't reveal her here, too. Yeah, but either way, he was very terrible to her in, in you know, things that, that, are, that are honestly, like, very, very serious and bad. Uh, and so I hated him then. He then used his power, because at a certain point he had uh, an amount of power, in, in ways that are might be illegal. Uh, against me personally, against this girl, against people uh, we knew. Uh, And so I just, like, this was the one person I was like, I'm going to have a grudge against this person. And then we move out to L.A., and lo and behold, so does that person. And they try to, first they try to succeed in the same comedy theater that we do. And I never encounter him during this time, but he is absolutely there at the same time. But he is so hateable that he gets himself banned within his first like six months of he was an intern there and they completely banned him. Just, I, I think, crimes against humanity again. <laughs> and then, you know, I was like, good, because I didn't want to run into this guy. I don't want to ever have to act on the fact that I have somebody on my enemy list. And then years pass and I get into uh, YouTube work. I start working in YouTube and I start working for a YouTuber who's a comedy YouTuber specifically. Uh, he knew me from doing comedy uh, back in Florida. And, you know, somebody else who did comedy back in Florida hits him up and is like, hey, I would love to work for you. Um, And weirdly, because this guy is oblivious, mentions, I know Philip works for you. I'm sure that, uh, you know, he'd love to to work with me, too. Which, like, oh, man, could not be more wrong. So the guy calls me, and this is the one time in my life I gave, he was like, I just need, you know, he, he listed you as a reference. Why would he do that? Why would he think, he must be so delusional if he thinks that you would be a good reference for him. So what do you think? Should we hire him? I said, yeah, you can totally hire him and I will quit the moment you do. <laughs> uh, and so he did not hire him. And then uh, I then I started working, uh, doing New Rockstars. And there was a time when New Rockstars looked like it was all going to fall apart. This is oh, yeah. that time when, <laughs> when the whole company was going under and it yep. wasn't even really New Rockstars yet. Uh-huh. Um, so I was worried I was going to lose my job. Uh, so I picked up another job running a, a YouTube channel for a much bigger company. Um, and I was the the creative director, which like there it was a very high level position at this this large company. But the and the only reason I'm calling out that it was high level is that there were a lot of people below me. It was it, they blew, there's a reason this company failed. They blew way too much money. Every video that I, I made had a budget of twenty thousand dollars, which Whoa. stupid. Yeah, so it was real stupid. Um, and they put me in charge, so you know <laughs> they goes to show. But that meant that one day I'm sitting uh, at my desk and I kind of just like look out the doorway. And I see the guy just walking right by, and then he does the backwards walk, and he leans in and he's like, "Hey, you you work here?" And then he kind of like sees my my sign on on the door and stuff, and he's like, "Oh, you're uh, in charge of this whole thing." And I was like, "Yeah." And like all I said, he's like, "Would be great to catch up or something." And I was like, "Huh?" Hmm. He's like, "I just got hired on PA on I think one of your shoots." And I was like, "Really interesting." He's like, "All right, well I'll see you on set," and he walked away, and I just watched him walk away. I get up and I go to the producer who is, uh, I'm like the guy who works for me. I'm like, that guy right there, you hired him as a PA? And he's like, oh, I think the coordinator or somebody, I don't hire the PAs. And I was like, he's gone. He's not on the shoot. And he was like, all right, I'll, I'll make it happen. The one time in my life I've ever pulled a move like that. You get one of them. I was like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I felt like, an, it's weirdly, I, I'm, I'm so not that type that I still feel guilty even telling the story, but you are one of the few people who knows how terrible yeah, this person yeah, was. Oh, God, you, you were even diplomatic. You should have like, 
put him on blast. This guy's yeah. I didn't, I didn't even say why. I was just like, I just uh, I don't feel comfortable working with that guy. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't want him on set. Uh, and so they they went and like he was his name was taken off the call sheet. Uh, I think they gave him a fake address to show up to in the middle of the ocean. I and then I never talked to him again. But then, I mean, maybe we're asking for this or whatever. The guy was so obsessed with trying to work in YouTube, he made his own channel. And I don't want to even send anyone to it. I don't want to talk about it too much uh, because it is one of the channels that is responsible for putting out conspiracy theories on the internet about people being secret pedophiles uh, or or trying to get people to not not just feel rage at at political figures and whatnot, but also like try to like tear their lives apart and just the disgusting lies, all the worst stuff that ever happens near any election season. This is one of the sources is yeah. this guy's channel. So that's what we're saying where it's like recent crimes against humanity. So this is the one person on my entire list that I ever and at some point I'll find you, I'll find I'll probably end up forgiving him or something. Don't you ever? It's the one person that I've ever felt like I've specifically actively bullied and I did it as an adult <laughs> yeah uh, this sounds less like bullying and more like righteous uh, justice and balance and scale tipping like cuz this man I wish we could go into the details but we we don't want to identify this person we don't want to give them any oxygen we, we'd, we'd open ourselves up also to like right. legal issues because right. like yeah. that, it's that level of stuff so if, yeah. if you give us names is it this person we're not gonna acknowledge it and just because we don't we don't want him to get any more views as a result of us yeah this guy's uh, he's he's is a real life bad guy. Yeah. You know what he is? He is like uh, Gary in Pokemon or Blue, right? So like anytime you think you have moved on in your life, this motherfucker shows back up and you gotta battle him and you gotta take him down. It's like, yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm done with the Elite Four. Wait, Gary's back? How does this guy keep coming back? And it just gets worse and worse and he's gone on his own weird evolved career track that just seems like the bizarro opposite of what you think the right thing is. But you, it's just like, it's like God put him on this earth to be your uh, your bizarro. And that's, that's he's your bizarro. Yeah, fine, he's my bizarro and we're anti each other forever. If you really want to know who it is, the clue I'll give you is C. Riggs. Or no, that's obvious, right? Uh, Chandler R. Uh, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> just, oh man. The trouble he's caused. <laughs> Why him? <laughs> Go! I'm I'm kidding. I, I like Chandler Riggs. Whoa, hold on a second, Kelly. Is that an earthquake? Are you feeling that? Yeah, that's an earthquake. 2020 is happening again, so. We should probably wrap this up. We should. Um, that is our show. Reminder that you can join our official Discord by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. And you can get an audio version of the show by subscribing to New Rockstars Big Question wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions, people who tweeted at us, of course, our Discord friends who sent us some really, really great questions this week. You can also mail us your questions at our PO box and tweet us your questions using the hashtag big question. Follow me at EA Voss, follow Philip at Philip Molina. And and follow new rock stars on socials and subscribe here on YouTube to get too much information about all the stuff you care about. See you next week. Let's get under our desks. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs>